Hello everybody, I'm your host Theo Wilton and today we're joined by professional cyclist uh, Jay Kallenbach. Uh, I'm really excited to be talking to him today because one of my the things that stood out to me in my research about him was that not only was he very well accomplished and like very successful and talented in his craft, but he was also a really good teammate and really helped support his team and grow his team into what it is today. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm kind of local Vermont cyclist. Um, been doing it for, I guess, kind of competitive bike racing for coming up on almost 20 years now. And uh, yeah, kind of do ro road cycling for many years and then do kind of doing mountain biking and um, some of the new kind of gravel riding and racing as well these days. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely gravel racing and definitely like a big growth in Vermont in the last few years. Yeah, it's an interesting kind of boom in general um, in the cycling world and then especially you know Vermont has actually kind of become a kind of a center hub um, of the riding of the racing touring of, of all of that yeah definitely which is really cool so first things first tell me about what sports you played growing up and then how you kind of got into cycling yeah so uh, growing up um, definitely did a decent bit of downhill skiing a um, little bit of cross-country skiing and then Kind of did some some soccer, and then I really loved my kind of passion was always uh, basketball. Mm -hmm. um, growing up, I really you know studied the like statistics of players, and you know did summer camps, and really loved basketball. Um, and then as I got into into high school, kind of quickly realized that uh, you know being a good basketball player in Vermont, or even a, a a mediocre or a poor basketball player as I was it wasn't really gonna get you far and uh, yeah it's just kind of like kind of came to a realization I was really better built for like the kind of endurance like running cycling cross-country skiing sports and then in in the high school years kind of transitioned towards towards doing those sports kind of carried that into uh, some time at UVM mm -hmm. doing uh, competitive running on the track and field and cross-country teams and then kind of then made a big like kind of transition away from running um, to cycling in that in the time at UVM. There's a period where they cut the track team. Yeah. That was when I was there. So then I, I kind of made the decision. I'd always kind of had an eye. I think as a lot of young people mm -hmm. do of like seeing the Tour de France on TV and catching a few minutes and kind of wondering what that was about and like knowing a few people who were into cycling. And so I had always been curious about the sport, and it was like that was a kind of a, a natural life transition to then, as a young young athlete in college, to switch over to biking. Yeah. And yeah, kind of pursued that from then on. Yeah, I think that's a pretty common story that a lot of cyclists can relate to. Yeah. Especially the going from playing like more ball oriented sports. I know like Lance Armstrong, for example, did that growing up in Texas. Yep. But then he found he was more built for like endurance athletics. Yep. Yeah. So uh, going off just your initial curiosity for cycling, what makes bike riding so special to you that you would want to dedicate so many like hours to training and preparation? Yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest, like from from coming from like basketball and then coming from running, honestly, like the equipment and the gear, like yeah. to be completely honest, I just always fascinated me of like, you know, you have the equipment of the bike and all the parts that kind of go with it, the shoes and the helmet and like, it's this like extension of it's not just you it's like kind of being married with the bike and and um that just always kind of like was appealing and the equipment looks kind of cool and yeah. sexy um and then i just like kind of have a passion for like thinking bikes are cool and then uh yeah i mean just in vermont it's so like it's such a beautiful place and state to explore you know, running, you know, I grew up kind of down the street from Shelburne Farms and did a lot of running in there, which is like, I mean, it's like a theme park for a runner, to be a high school runner, a college runner, and that's that's the place where you have to explore. But then beyond that, like, you know, getting into road cycling, it was just, you could I could see so much more of the whole state, you know, going over the mountains and riding, you know, in the Champlain Valley, um, you know, north you know, north of Burlington, south of Burlington, you know, even into the Adirondacks a little bit. Just the kind of pace of travel and how much you get to see. I mean, you can go out for, you can, you know, you can do a good 90 minute run and see a, a fair amount, but if you, you can ride a bike for four or five hours and see so much of Vermont. Yeah. So that, that kind of, I really love that. Yeah, definitely. Exploration on a bike is pretty much unmatched. Yeah, it's pretty it special. Might even be better than like on a car because you're really 
connected to the land in a different way. Exactly. Yeah, you see in people, you know, gardening in their front yards and, you know, animals, you know, turkeys in a field. And yeah, all sorts, of, all sorts of crazy things you see, yeah, when you're out riding. So one thing you me mentioned that you uh, earlier was that you, like, studied basketball statistics. Yeah. And you mentioned how you like all the equipment on, yeah. like, a bike. Yeah. So do you do you think you're a person that focuses on like little things like drivetrain efficiency and aerodynamics and like your <laughs> rolling resistance? Yeah. Yeah. I would say uh, I like to be like informed and aware of all those things, and then kind of like self-selectedly decide what I want to kind of choose to to incorporate. So I try to keep things like you know pretty straightforward and simple, yeah. but make sure that. Yeah, I guess so almost like making sure that I'm not making any big mistakes, mm -hmm. leaving anything like big on the table in yeah. terms of, yeah, speed and efficiency and, yeah, things like that. Um, and, yeah, just kind of aware of, I guess, trends. It's an interesting sport. You know, any sport where there's equipment, whether it's something like skiing or car racing or, or bike racing, there's like there's these progressions of the equipment and kind of mm -hmm. keeping, keeping uh, forward of that. Is interesting yeah for sure like even in the Tour de France this year we've seen uh, every team pretty much transition from tubular tires to tubeless yeah and then also Ineos was the last team to make the transition to disc brakes to disc instead brakes. of rim brakes yeah so all those little things can really add up and make a big difference yeah yeah and even in road cycling there was a, a really important one of the biggest and imp most important races in Italy in the beginning of the year was pretty much won by the use of a dropper seat post, which is like a mountain bike technology yeah. that this one rider decided to incorporate into a road bike, which nobody had ever yeah. even like thought of. And it was like, it's just so interesting to like be able to kind of use those kind of, you know, th just thinking about the equipment to make those, you know, those choices and yeah, get, get a result yeah. like that. It's always fun to be fast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's fun and be comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. So next thing about being fast, tell me about how your training program was structured. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, when I first came into cycling, you know, really not much structure. I had always come from from uh, track and field, you know, doing it with uh, whether it was a high school or whether it was uh, in college. And basically, you know, you just kind of showed up to practice yeah. and you found, you know, you did the workout and um you know, and there was a little bit of collaboration. I had one good, especially good assistant coach at UVM, Joe Gingras, who's still there. And uh, there was, you know, there would be a, some amount of collaboration in terms of figuring out what I was going to be doing coming up. But really, he was kind of helping figure all that stuff yeah. out. So then when I got into cycling, I would say, like, initially it was just, you know, so many skills to just learn to ride the bike. Yeah. You know, like to be able to take a water bottle out of the water bottle holder while you're moving along, you know, just simple skills like mm -hmm. that in the first year, couple of years, um, to ride in group, and then kind of figuring out, yeah, to, that you, you really need to ride longer. Like the time, just the yeah. time spent needs to be more. Um, yeah, and kind of trial and error. And then I was uh, kind of fortunate enough after a couple of years to join a team from kind of the kind of north of Boston area called CCB, which is still around today, kind of one of the, you know, teams that's been around in New England for a long time and had a couple good kind of mentors, the guy who ran the team and then one of the older riders on the team who really who really taught me a lot of kind of what I learned to know, which I guess I, I've always been, even though I help some people with some structured training now, kind of have been somewhat less structured in my own riding yeah. um, and especially these days having a kid and a family mm -hmm. and still trying to work a little bit um, not that structured but uh, yeah kind of like figured out what worked and what didn't work and when to do certain rides in advance of a race and yeah. how, how kind of for me how I recovered yeah yeah just kind of trial and error over say a decade <laughs> yeah yeah Yep. <laughs> so like in the lead up to a race, would you mm. typically want to do like lower effort and higher volume? Yeah, I was kind of a, f a funny rider initially, I would say in the first couple of years when I was racing and I would like not do too much riding in the period, like right before um, races. And a lot of times I would feel like re if it was a weekend of racing, I'd feel really bad on Saturday, yeah. a little bit better on, um, on a Sunday. 
And then when I got home on Monday and was riding by myself, I would just feel like a million bucks. Like so, so fast. Yeah. Like I wish I had, you know, I might have gotten dropped from the, you know, the front group on the weekend and I felt like I could just fly. So then really common was I would actually start to do um, actually like pretty long kind of harder rides on a Thursday <laughs> if I was racing on the weekend, yeah. like which is, I don't know if that's what a lot of people did, but all of a sudden, I, even though I was a little like maybe physically tired, I would just sleep better. I was somebody who like kind of would like sometimes over and I'd be nervous or excited before a race and not sleep well the night before. And just doing that bigger, longer ride on a Thursday kind of made made you tired. Yeah, <laughs> help help just kind of relieve relieve the nerves and mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. Then definitely once I started doing that, it took me it took me a couple of years to kind of figure that out. And then uh, once I started doing that, I could show up on Saturday and Sunday and feel pretty good and ready to go. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I haven't yeah. heard that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so my next question for you is. Yeah. Uh, moving away from training and yep. more towards like a race day, what has been your most memorable racing experience? Ooh. I know there's been a lot I for know. you. <laughs> there, yeah, it's definitely years and years. Um, yeah, I would say like one of, kind of one of the most, I think like interesting races or ones that I had done was, it's it's not running now, but um, the company Louis Garneau, mm -hmm. which in, you know, in the U.S. is based in Vermont, but in, um, Globally, they're in, in Quebec City. They used to run a race that would finish at the Louis Garneau headquarters, and it started in Montreal. So it was a point-to-point -point race that was, you know, one a one-day race about 250 kilometers, all and the way to Quebec City. all the way to Quebec yeah. City. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just a race I'd kind of heard a little bit about, and then finally got to go up to it one year, and kind of had like a European feel with like all the team cars and you know it's a point to point so there's a lot of organization of getting people on feeds and um, and it's a prevailing cross tailwind and the first year I did it there was a prevailing cross tailwind and it was unlike anything I'd ever done there was like a group of 17 riders that made a break and you know some people who just you know down the road in a couple of years became you know really top riders internationally yeah. Canadian riders who were there that year and uh, yeah, I think like literally the average speed was something like 30.5 miles an hour, <laughs> which at the time I had done it, it was yeah. it was the fastest race I'd ever done yeah. and the longest race, which is, yeah, just a unique experience. And um, yeah, that was a, a really favorite of mine, kind of cool experience. So what was you going through your mind when those echelons were forming and what did you learn from that? Uh, yeah, it was very painful. <laughs> so yeah, with the cross tailwind, basically with the speed that the riders are moving at, the um, the draft is really sh is kind of fast and short and so riders will you know move over to the side of the road so everybody basically almost a hundred riders long is in the wind yeah. and fighting i spent about f the first 50 minutes of that day just riding like in the gutter of the road <laughs> avoiding you know you know stuff in the side of the road and you know because you're trying to catch a little draft moving at that speed i mean it's not possible to ride at that speed yeah. by yourself. So you're trying to kind of stay in the draft and you're at the edge of the road. And uh, yeah, I don't think I shifted out of the two hardest gears on my bike. It's a, you know, this is an entirely <laughs> flat road along yeah. the St. Lawrence. I don't think I shifted out of the two hardest gears in my bike until somewhere into the second hour of the race. So uh, yeah, it was really fast, hard to eat food. <laughs> um, I actually like, we stopped that, that little like kind of a funny team we were on we stopped at like tim hortons that we we're always running late yeah. to races just uniformly and like we were running late and we stopped at a tim hortons that morning and i had a breakfast sandwich tim hortons breakfast sandwich stuffed in the in, <laughs> in my jersey and uh in the breakaway after after probably two two and a half hours like things calmed down a little bit to where like instead of just eating a gel calmed and we were you know able to like take a break and and eat some f food and i pulled out that tim horton sandwich and i i remember all the canadian riders i could they almost could like hear the wrapper of a tim horton's wrapper yeah, opening and it. everybody <laughs> looked over to see what i was eating and uh i got a couple of, like trade offers for a couple water bottle like water bottles i'll give you a bottle yeah you know, give me some of that sandwich and i i ate that whole sandwich it was delicious <laughs> Yeah. So. Yeah, I love Tim Hortons. Exactly. Like living in Ottawa, it's really big up there. Yeah, exactly. And also riding around like the St. Lawrence Valley is yeah. really beautiful, but really yep. flat at the same time. Yep. 
Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't want to go into the headwind, but with the cross tailwind at your back, it was, yeah, it was really cool. Yeah. So looking at your race record, yeah. I know that you've had a lot of success winning races at the criterium stages, which is yeah. just for those of who don't know is just laps usually yep. around like in a city. Yep. And so that's definitely one of your strengths, but what do you consider your other strength maybe outside of criteriums? Yeah, I would say generally like, um, probably it's like somewhat more technical courses. Mm -hmm. So courses where there might be a fair amount of like descending or cornering. Um, I mean, generally, I'd like, I think once I'm in shape, I'm reasonably well-rounded rider. Certainly kind of probably the least, the least strong suit would be like long extended climbs at the end, yeah. end of races. Um, but shorter, shorter kind of punchy climbs I usually enjoy. But I, I particularly enjoy, I think, I got to a point where with like efficiency on the bike, I'm pretty good in like moving, moving kind of through a field yeah. um, and kind of knowing, kind of understanding the races. Yeah. It took a, you know, and that, that's something that probably took, you know, really like started to get better after six or seven years. And then, uh, yeah, it took, took, takes a while to learn that stuff. I think for you know i started in my early 20s for riders who might start when they're in their teens they might kind of pick up that that Maybe. stuff a little quicker and a little earlier but i do feel like i was able to kind of push through and kind of master some of the like the tactics and the the pack skills that uh yeah again like with that i had a, one teammate on that team ccb a guy named amos brumble who's kind of like a, a underground legend of new england in yeah. terms of like the skills and the understanding of races and I learned a lot from him yeah definitely like moving through a field moving through a peloton takes yep. just a lot of years just to get used to that yep exactly definitely like a veteran skill yeah yeah to stay calm mm -hmm. um, when you're doing all that stuff I would just realize like when I first the first years when I was starting I would finish a, a race weekend um, and just be like physically tired but especially like mentally exhausted yeah just because like trying to be in a pack and like understanding the tactics and you know moving around safely and kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do what other people were want, trying to do yeah it's like this it, you know from running it's if running is checkers bike racing is chess and there's just so much mental energy that is constantly going into figuring out what's happening mm -hmm. and uh, initially as a young rider that was just exhausting um, where all the thinking and figuring all that stuff out is not like intuitive and then I all of a sudden got to a, like a point where like I noticed it because the feeling of like constant butterflies and nervousness having that before a race on a start line like it started to subside yeah. um, and just realized like oh I kind of like understand and this isn't as kind of constantly stressful or mentally taxing yeah definitely yeah. like different tactics are really interesting to kind of learn about and yeah having a powerful team around you that's well experienced can be the difference between winning and losing. Yep, absolutely. We've definitely like seen that at the tour this year. Yeah. Like maybe Tade Pogacar is maybe the best rider. Absolutely. But Jumbo Visma is the best all around team. Yep. Yeah, and it's especially interesting in this like he's having it Pogacar's having an issue of like in the day and age of COVID, mm -hmm. um, he's had several teammates kind of test positive during the race and they have to be kind of taken out or removed from the race. So He's got a team of kind of dwindling riders and I'm sure, you know, somewhat dwindling morale as well yeah. as this other really powerful team with many riders um, is able to kind of execute a tactics and plans on the road. Yeah, it makes a big difference. Yeah. And that's an interesting thing kind of conceptually to kind of understand as a young rider. I mean, there certainly are times and types of races. I mean, it's one of the things about, especially about mountain biking and gravel biking yeah. where like the team component is less yeah it's more individual more individual the road cycling is occasionally there's courses where it doesn't really come into play but most of the time at, at, in elite cycling it, it is definitely a big component mm -hmm. yeah definitely having like uh just a few days ago Pogacar didn't have any teammates to like drop back and give him food yep and then he cracked on the last climb of the day yep just because not enough calories yep exactly and yeah, talking with some friends the other day, kind of about some of the tour stages, I was like, especially on like climbs, of like, what's the benefit of having some teammates around? 
and like we're, I was saying like yeah some some of it's like pacing and things like uh, you know getting food you know food and drink f bottles from them but some of it's just kind of the comfort literally yeah, comfort yeah. of like hey this person is in the same jersey and they're like they're helping yeah. they're helping <laughs> me and like it's just situations can be a little less scary yeah. of like certain riders trying to drop you or attack and uh, being able to keep up with people when you have teammates around it's just kind of a like a feeling yeah that reassuring it, reassuring exactly yep yep so yeah one thing you keep harping on is just that uh, cycling is really mental yeah so what are some things like you do before a race just to get yourself mentally um, prepared yeah I mean these days these days a lot less yeah. um, but yeah I would you know it's a balance a little bit of for me it was always a little bit of a balance of like trying to understand the, you know, I'd look at like the courses, trying to understand like, you know, what, you know, if there were climbs or specific, you know, critical points of a course of where, where that would be and where that would come. Certainly would oftentimes look at like, you know, riders who are going to be in a race so that, you know, on the start line, I kind of had, you know, like once you, you just see a set of riders and you kind of know what's, you know, how the race will play out. Yeah. Because the course will dictate a race, but also... The riders themselves and the, the teams will dictate a race but as i was saying like you know i would sometimes get a little too nervous or too excited or you find find it hard to sleep the night before a race so it was a balance of like trying to know those things but trying to not know too much and overthink it where i would get nervous or yeah so yeah trying to stay calm a little bit trying to stay calm exactly yeah and sometimes that would be like you know instead of uh you know getting to sleep perfectly on time. It was like relaxing with a movie with some friends the yeah. night before and just kind of trying to forget about the cycling or the racing. Yeah. yeah. So in Vermont, we're pretty lucky that we have like access to all these backcountry roads yep. to bike on. Yeah. And then even here in Burlington, they've been investing in uh, bike paths in the last few years. Yep. So I'm curious as to what are some of the ways you're staying kind of active in the Vermont cycling community? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been fortunate. Uh, Kind of since actually about the same time when I when I started really cycling and, and bike racing, I started working at the ski rack, mm -hmm. which is you know kind of a, a cornerstone you know bike and you know sports store in Burlington, and just honestly working there yeah. has always really connected me to to what's going on. You know work you know the ski rack has always worked with like programs with um, uh, you know all sorts of different community you know organizations and stuff. Um, whether it's, you know, bike path, youth riders, um, cycling clubs, events, yeah. that kind of stuff. And then, um, for myself, uh, probably like probably eight years ago or so, gradually started working with like young, younger riders. Um, so helping kind of coach and, um, kind of figure out like racing for younger, mostly like high school, maybe into college racers, um, kind of coming out of Vermont. And helping kind of organize training equipment that yeah. kind of stuff um, for them and I you know all sorts of different things like whether it's uh, like coming up there's a rooted Vermont is a is a big gravel race yeah. that uh, a professional Tour de France rider who lives in Vermont now organizes right out of Richmond and mm -hmm. I'm gonna help lead a, a mountain bike race as kind of part of the yeah. part of the organization and yeah, there's just always kind of things like that that are coming and going and yeah, happening. So at Ski Rack, I'm curious if your uh, job and your work includes being a mechanic. Yeah, not so much exactly like hands-on what you think of a mechanic, but I do. what I do there is mostly like kind of help people with their bike adjustments. Yeah. So what we'll call like bike fitting, Yeah. Uh, which has some like kind of, it's mechanic light, yeah. you know, <laughs> like replacing handlebars and uh, seat posts, seat posts <laughs> and yeah, moving cleats around on shoes, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, mechanic light, uh, but that's the kind of main thing in the, with bikes that I do there. Okay. Yeah, which yeah, is, is fun. Yeah, yeah, not too technical. You don't have to like replace bearings. Ever. No, yeah, <laughs> not, I'm not taking bikes apart and re-putting yeah. re them together, no. Um, um, so I know you're pretty busy with your life. You have like kids at home, a wife. Yeah. You're still spending time getting out on the bike. So I'm curious if you've been keeping up on the Tour de France at all. Yeah, I, uh, these days, I used to, definitely when I was younger, I would, you know, get the coffee and the pastries and yeah. sit down on the couch when I had more time and kind of watch the whole stages. I would kind of watch uh, 
kind of short short highlights these days, yeah. which is is awesome. Sometimes I'm able to catch a little bit. Oftentimes, probably I watched like for bike racing, like the mountain bike races, mm -hmm. the World Cup mountain bike races. I try to watch those live sometimes. Um, but yeah, I usually watch kind of the daily highlights for the Tour de France, which is which is good fun. And what do you think about some of the younger generation of riders that are coming up now? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I think the uh, you know so many of the younger riders are being multidisciplined, yeah. which in cycling there's there's um, there is time uh, trial. Well, there's there's road cycling, which yep. includes time trial. There's mountain biking. There's cyclocross riding, yep. and traditionally each of these a rider would kind of specialize. Mm -hmm. Um, and even the many of the younger mountain bike racers, there's a number of uh, cross-country mountain bike racers I help coach, and they're even doing the enduro racing, which is almost like more downhill gravity oriented. They're doing gravel racing. So, and you see it at the highest international levels now, where I think just yesterday the rider who won the probably the most important stage of the Tour de France on the Alpe d'Huez, yep. he's last year's Olympic mountain bike champion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he won the cyclocross world championships which were in the u.s this past winter so he's is which is something like 10 years ago yeah, nobody nobody would imagine that yeah. one rider would do that and so i think that's kind of an interesting trend of the young riders are so skilled across a diverse i mean it would almost being like being a world cup alpine skier and a world cup cross-country skier maybe not that yeah. far apart but like yeah, or like, yeah. yeah, pretty close, yeah, which is interesting. Yeah, definitely. Tom Pitcock, really talented writer. And then we see the same things with kind of like Wow Van Aert and Matthew Vanderpool. Yeah. Their background in cyclocross, yep. which is obviously like going through mud, <laughs> yep. really slow, but really technical, requires a lot of bike handling skills. Yep. And then even now that helps them road cycling in the tour. Exactly. And I think so many of these riders just love and enjoy riding so many different types of bikes and enjoying Mm -hmm. all the different things that cycling can offer yeah which is cool yeah, yeah. there's a fun highlight of wow van art the other day almost like hitting the back of a team car yep. and then because of his really good proficient uh, bike handling skills he's able to kind of swerve and yep. stay upright so. yeah yeah it's the, the skill level is really really high mm -hmm. um and it's interesting like hearing i would say like i kind of noticed this a little bit in the last couple of years and then um i would hear like kind of older older cyclists on like the international, like in the, something like the Tour de France, yeah. just saying like how challenging just even moving up in the pack yeah. is with the younger, yeah. uh, with the kind of younger riders around them. And just, I think it's just cause these riders are so skilled, so adept in terms of balance and steering on the bike. Um, yeah, it is true. Yeah, it's cool to see. Yeah, yeah. okay. Do you have anything else you wanna add before we close? Um, yeah, go ride your bike, everybody. <laughs> Summer's happening. It's great. Yeah, good message. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you for talking me, uh, with me today, Jake. Yeah, I enjoyed coming in. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank Have you, a good everybody. One. Yeah, cheers.